Um, okay, so um, uh, as uh, Justin already introduced me, I'm now going to talk a bit about uh, what's new in Systemd in 2016. I'll actually cover two things. Um, half of it, it's, or more than half of it, is actually going to be about the stuff that we did in 2015 and the beginning of 2016, and uh, the other stuff that we're working on 2016. Um, so yeah, a little bit um, more about the, I mean, it's going to be a fairly technical talk, actually. But I'll, I'll initially talk a little bit about the community. Like, uh, we had the GitHub uh, presenter just talking in front of me, so, uh, before me. So one of the things uh, um, that actually changed in 2015 is that we switched to GitHub with our project, which is um, like, uh, it's, it's, it's much better, I think, than the stuff that we had before. It also has uh, quite a few drawbacks. But uh, the, the major goal that we wanted to achieve with that is actually um, increase our, uh, the, the, the the, our base of contributors um, by making it easier to contribute because most people already have a GitHub account uh, while the stuff that we're using bef before which was like free desktop and, and, and these kind of things and uh, Bugzilla and, and stuff um, wasn't really um, like people generally don't have accounts there so it's much more difficult for people to contribute and that worked out um, I think uh, nowadays that we're on GitHub we got a lot of more of these uh, drive-by um, contributions, like people who just um, uh, found some bug in, in something or want to have some improvement in, in, in one component of systemd. And they quickly hack it up and uh, push it into a PR, and then we can actually merge that. So um, these kind of drive-by patches, I believe, are one of the, of the most, important, uh, most important kind of contributions to um, open source projects because they actually make the polishing of a project, right? Like, they, they, they fill in the, the, the little gaps that, that make the software nice to use. Um, so yeah, GitHub is much better, but it still has major issues. It's kind of incompatible with our workflow in some ways. Um, so it was actually surprising to us that, that GitHub, which is like the thing that everybody uses these days, um, still has these issues that we think there is. I'm not going to go into too much detail what that is, um, but uh, yeah. Also, um, Systemd has nowadays been adopted uh, by all the big distributions. Um, like the one major exception that people know is Gentoo, um, but uh, everything else, like like all the commercial distributions, like RHEL and, and Slash and things like that, have adopted it, and all the community distributions like Debian and Fedora have too. So um, if you if you're running a distribution from the last year or two or something, you're very likely to run Systemd. So um, yeah, it's it's commercially and community um, adopted, I guess. But uh, of course, uh, create, uh, raises the question if, if all the con controversies around systemd, which I think most of you probably uh, noticed in the, in the community going on, are over now, and uh, whether we are boring now, right? Like because, uh, um, well, it's done now, right? Like and uh, the decisions have been made, so maybe uh, there's something else to discuss uh, over the next years. Anyway, um, something uh, like, you know, systemd, we always define that as this basic building block, like this basic um, a, a set of tools that you can build an operating system from or a distribution from. Uh, one of the more recently added uh, um, uh, uh, components of systemd is networkd. Networkd is a, well, as the name suggests, a network configuration um, system. It's, uh, of course, um, there are many of those already in the um, around, but uh, Network D, I think, is, is a much nicer one because it is very generic and, and is uh, capable of applying configuration like that you write once to many interfaces and, and it has all these interlinking. So in, in many ways, it does what ma Network Manager does on most Linux distribution, but uh, it does it differently and does it in a, in, a, in a way that we think is actually nicer and generally more compatible with, with much of the stuff that administrators and amateur people want to do with it. Um, Network D is far from complete, right? Like, you cannot even... You cannot even talk to it dynamically, right? Like everything you do is you write rules and will execute them, but uh, you cannot even talk to it just yet. But that didn't stop um, many embedded developers and many cloud um, uh, 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 distributions to actually adopt it already. So this is one of the more recent successes we had is that um, both Fedora's and Ubuntu's Cloud Edition now in install NetworkD by default and use that for network configuration. Because in, in, like, in the cloud um, systems, usually it's pretty easy, right? Like you have usually just one interface and you want to do DHCP for that and it should be dynamic and things like that. And that's pretty much, um, NetworkD is perfect for that because it can do that and can do that dynamically and can do that nicely and, and things like that and has not many, many uh, um, like dependencies and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah. Um, another um, big success, I think, that uh, we saw with Systemd, another um, component of Systemd, which is Nspawn, it's, it's like it's a minimal container manager. 
Um, actually, my second talk today is going to be pretty much about that. Um, it got actually adopted by Core OS Rocket. I'm sure if you guys know Core OS Rocket, like uh, you know Docker, like Docker is like the hot thing in, in, in Linux these days. Uh, Rocket is something like that. It's developed by Core OS. And um, they decided to, to, for the actual container, containerization, like the back end, like the lowest part of the containerization, that there's no need for them to actually develop that again and again and again. And they instead um, decided to use <coughs> this minimal functionality that's built into systemd. Um, right away. So it's, it's kind of like we like to see this kind of stuff because uh, we consider ourselves as the providers of these basic building blocks, right? Where other people build stuff from. Like if it's an operating system or if it's a container manager like Rocket, um, that doesn't really matter much. But we see our position as the ones who just provide the building blocks and we do not necessarily uh, build the finished product. That's what other people should be doing. Um, What's also a big success, uh, which is a little bit surprising actually, is for Network D, we wrote this uh, minimal DHCP implementation because uh, you know everybody, or many people here I think, know what DHCP is. It's this thing that assigns you an IP address. It's actually one of the most trivial protocols uh, we have, right? Like um, uh, um, all the devices uh, in the world implemented, and it's basically uh, uh, um, something where you exchange five messages and that's it. Um, now, um, most of the network, man network management solutions before us, before Network D, um, used uh, one of the standard implementations of that. And uh, if you look at them, most of them are crazy, and they they are not integrated because they call out to that. And we decided, okay, let's just do it as a library and do it minimal, and do it something um, that actually can be reused by the network management solutions directly instead of calling out to these external projects so that they don't have these dependencies and, and asynchronous behavior and things like that. So, and that actually, we wrote that for Network D. And uh, it, uh, we wrote it in, in style of a library that we could eventually even make public. But we never ever actually made it public yet because uh, we weren't really sure about the API and uh, if it should look like that when we make it stable. But that actually didn't stop Network Manager to adopt that too. So now both Network D and Network Manager actually use our internal library for, for DHCP, which I, I find pretty cool because, um, I mean, in a way, they are the competition to Network D. Um, Another project we have been working on is systemd resolve D. Systemd resolve D is a, um, a, a stub DNS resolver. So you might ask a question, of course, what does a, a stub DNS resolver um, have to do with systemd? Um, and again, our definition of what systemd is is really like it's a, it's a, it's a toolbox of the basic um, components that make up an operating system. And we believe that DNS resolver should be part of that. Now, glibc, right, like the GNU the C library. Um, it already contains a, a DNS stop resolver. So what systemd resolve D adds on top of that is actually that it is uh, DNSSEC capable. DNSSEC is this thing that uh, does basically allows authentication of uh, DNS lookup so that you actually have proof that this IP address is actually the IP address for the domain that you try to look up. So that if you, if you go to your banking website and, and let's say it's called foobank.com, um, that you actually end up at the website that foobank.com maps to and nobody can interfere with that. Um, it's something that has been deployed on the internet for a while, and uh, um, we thought, okay, it should actually be something that should end up on, the, on people's uh, systems um, that it actually is used, because this information is by default not used in, on uh, these systems. The system resolve D also adds a couple of other things, like it does MDNS and LLMNR um, by default, um, so it, it not only does um, DNS, like the internet name lookup stuff, but also local stuff. Um, it's uh, relatively closely integrated with Network D, so it gets all this DNS information from Network D. Um, yeah, most of the time, hopefully, people will not even notice that System D Resolve D is there. It's uh, it's uh, mostly just a component that is low level and an API for applications. Um, yeah, that's basically what I put here. Like the stuff that it enables, um, among other things, is that you can actually embed cert uh, certificate information in the DNS, right? You know, the DNS for those who don't know is actually this naming system that you is used, for example, too, so that www.rathat.com um, is resolved to IP addresses. And by using DNSSEC, right, like be, by using have this authentication information, you can actually embed, it, embed security information like uh, certificates in the DNS, and you can make sure that they are only trusted if, if, if the um, signature actually matches. Anyway, I don't want to talk too much about uh, all this stuff because it's uh, fairly specific and probably not too interesting for many of you. So the next thing I would like to talk about is unified control group hierarchy. That's actually a fairly technical topic. Like it's a fairly low-level topic, but it's actually one that has been driving us for a while. Um, 
Control groups are a Linux feature that, that basically allow systemd to take services with all their processes, apply resource limits to them, right? So resource limits means, for example, that they um, only can have that much memory and that much CPU, or um, that they um, have other constraints uh, during runtime. It also allows systemd to track the runtime of the services so that we know exactly what, how many processes a specific service has running at a, a certain point in time and uh, when these processes die. It also allows us, because we can enumerate them, we can kill the service and things like that. C groups has been around for quite a while. Um, C groups, um, like C groups is short for control groups. Um, C groups is a kernel interface, and quite frankly, it has always been a disaster um, API wise what the kernel provided there. And we always had to deal with that in the systemd context and try to abstract that away and integrate it nicely with service management so that administrators don't have to care. Right? So that um, administrators can write in the service files, they can say, um, this service gets so much CPU and so much memory and so much disk and, and things like that, uh, so that they don't actually have to think about that. But we, under the hood in systemd, we always had to deal with the fact that the kernel APIs for all of this were horrible. Now, uh, the kernel community, and specifically uh, Tejun Heo, um, has been working on cleaning that up on the kernel um, side. That, however, involves um, completely redesigning um, the kernel API. So, and that um, project is called Unified Control Group Hierarchy. So it basically looks at this control group um, 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 stuff and, and throws out all the, the, the really badly designed API parts and turns it into something that is much, much nicer. What we have been working on with systemd is actually making sure that systemd can work with that. It's not complete yet. The new, u, new unified hierarchy was actually released for the first time as a stable API in the kernel that was released like two weeks ago, which whose number I don't actually know. Um, with uh, uh, systemd actually doesn't yet run on the newest kernel because I changed the API in that part uh, in that in the last um, uh, weeks or something about that. But uh, basically, all the all the groundwork um, in systemd is done um, that makes it work with unified hierarchy. With unified hierarchy, everything gets so much nicer because, like, the code base in systemd gets mi much nicer. But then it also means that uh, a couple of new features are are viable for for users because we can actually start exposing a lot of resource management things to users. In the long run, that that for example means that we can even do firewalling and, and systemd in these kind of things. Um, it also means that we have the PITS controllers, which is something very sim simple, actually. Like, if you do service management, which systemd does, you want to be able to put a limit on the number of processes that a specific service can have, right? Um, and PITS controller is that. It's, it's, it's a simple thing. But yeah, there's also the concept of safe delegation. Um, it's fairly technical. It's really about um, that if you run Docker or some container manager, um, so that the C group um, um, hierarchy, so the C groups, these groups are organized in a hierarchy. Um, you can actually give parts to that to the container managers so that they can run their own stuff and can even um, start systemd below that recursively. It's probably, yeah, I, I figure like you probably can't make much of the sense of all of the, uh, the, these things that I'm talking about here because it's, it is really fa uh, fairly low level and very technical. But um, yeah, it's a thing that we worked on. So if effectively, like uh, um, what the only thing that uh, users will see of that, right? If they ever interface directly with the C groups hierarchy, which you can do because in Linux um, that's actually exposed as a as a uh, file system, um, then basically the only change is that if you go to sysfs C group and they previously had the controller name there, and then you see the hierarchy, the system you manages afterwards, it lo just looks like this, and the controller was removed. Um, and that's kind of the the essence of it. But anyway, I'll go to the next thing now, um, because that is a little bit, uh, yeah. If you want to know more details about the unified hierarchy, um, ask me in, on uh, Sunday. Um, another thing that we did in uh, System recently was SDBuzz. SDBuzz is a, is a, it's a DBuzz library implementation. Um, for those who don't know, DBuzz is kind of the IPC system um, that we uh, generally use in syst uh, on, on Linux systems these days. It's what AppStart used to do. It's what um, uh, uh, Systemd uses. Uh, it basically allows um, um, applications to talk to each other and talk to Systemd. Um, we used uh, a generic implementation, um, like the classic DBuzz reference implementation, for the longest time in Systemd. But it's it's not very nice code, and it's very baroque. Like you need a lot of to write a lot of code to use it. 
Um, while we always thought uh, it should uh, make much more stuff um, um, do that automatically for us so that we don't have to write the code for that. So um, a while back we wrote it as Dbus, which is our own um, Dbus library, and it's much, much nicer. I blocked that about that a couple of times. So if you actually have to talk to the Dbus system, and um, I think most uh, Linux developers probably have to do sooner or later, um, then consider using that library. It's a C library, so it's only relevant for, for, for C people and C++ people, maybe. Um, uh, but yeah, it's really written to make Dbus nice to use, so that you, the, the, the code that you need to actually um, invoke a, a method remotely on the local system is actually shortened as much as possible. Um, related to this, we actually provide a library called sdevent. It's an event loop library. Um, it's uh, because if you if you do debuzz, um, then you always get these these method calls coming in and going out, and you get the replies asynchronously and these kind of things. Um, we needed some kind of event loop, um, like an event loop is basically the core part of every process um, that you have on Linux. Um, we published that thing as SD event. There's no need for people to actually use that. They can use their own event loops if they want to. They can either write them on the, themselves or use, use an event loop uh, provided by some other library like glib. SD event is simply the event loop that we use inside of systemd. And we think it's a really, really good one um, uh, for many reasons. Um, um, yeah, I don't want to go too much into detail because my time's already over anyway, mostly. But uh, yeah, if you if you if you're writing a low-level um, component like an embedded component or something for Linux, um, consider having a look at that. Um, I already talked about Network D and, and this network management stuff. Um, uh, we added a couple of things there too, like Slack and IPv4 ACD. That's um, yeah for those. It's mostly IPv6 stuff, the, the um, uh, Slack stuff. It's, uh, it's about um, assigning addresses. Uh, we have our own implementation about that uh, now, which basically means that network D, if you have it in the end, um, it doesn't have any dependencies, right? It doesn't pull in DHCP and, 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 and all these external components to, to, to actually function in the most basic way. It just, it just does it natively. Um, it also does IPv4 ACD, which is uh, a collision detection. Like it's it's uh, automatic detection if if two hosts on the same network use the same IP address. Um, like m some operating systems have that functionality. Linux never had that uh, built in, and we added that to Network D so that you can actually you will notice that, um, which is really interesting information to know that if you have misconfigured your network. Um, yeah, and it also has a Dbus API now. It's it's not complete, but it's uh, something we're going to work on. Um, and spawn, I'm going to talk about that in more detail in my other talk, so I'm going to skip over this mostly. Uh, something completely random is uh, we added support for IS USB function FS. Um, this basically means that you can have services in systemd now that don't do socket activation for those who know what socket activation is, but USB uh, function activation, which basically allows you to run a service. Like if you if you build an embedded device, for example, and, and it has a USB connector so that you can connect it to your laptop, um, and that device um, can provide services over USB that don't have to run all the time, but are only um, started the moment where somebody actually connects the USB cable to that device and tries to make use of them, right? Which most of the USB functionality is like that, because after all, the USB functionality is used uh, mostly as exception and not as, as uh, uh, most of the time. So uh, we have built that in natively so that you can do automatic um, so, uh, activation of that functionality so that, yeah, basically you have a service and you just say, yeah, don't run that service normally, but the moment somebody plugs in something and actually requests that USB service start in that moment. It came actually from the uh, Samsung people also who, who did that for embedded devices. Um, something else completely different is we added uh, keyring support, kernel keyring support for Lux keys. Uh, the kernel keyring is uh, functionality that you can can upload um, cryptographic keys that are required by the system into the kernel, and we closed one gap there so that the cryptographic keys for hardware dis uh, um, uh, encryption are, can also be placed there. Um, something for administrators is we have system control reboot dash dash firmware, which basically allows uh, people who run EFI systems at least, if they want to reboot the system, they can specify dash dash firmware now, which puts them in the in the firmware setup. Right? This is actually really really useful uh, um, uh, functionality because on, on many of the newer laptops. Um, uh, uh, that, that uh, boot very, very fast, um, they uh, try to avoid to achieve booting very fast by not initializing a USB controller. And not initializing a USB controller means that you cannot actually use the, the USB keyboard that you might have to, to uh, interact with the BIOS firmware and actually get into the BIOS setup. So um, that basically means your USB keyboard, you can use it to interface Linux, but not with the BIOS. This is basically um, uh, gets you out of that misery that you can actually uh, use get into the firmware setup anyway by simply specifying that thing. 
Um, and that's actually the last slide I have, uh, something we, we have been working on, a system control revert and system control refresh. It's not um, out yet, but it basically allows revert allows you to, the, if you, if you uh, get a service like, say, a MySQL or like HTTPD, um, and you, 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 you did resource management with it, like you, you specified memory limits or, or, or CPU limits or whatever else, um, with it, and then you finally figure out, okay, now I want to go back to the original vendor supply defaults, and you can use system control re revert and we'll drop all that. Um, and system control refresh is something we have been working on for a while, which is actually really, really complex, but hopefully very useful for people. It's basically a way how you can uh, reload the configuration of specific daemons only instead of the entire um, uh, systemd system. So it's it actually, you know, it, it, it will reload the configuration about specific systemd services, not so if you if you write system control refresh HTTPD, it will actually um, reload the stuff that systemd knows about that service, not the service itself. Um, previously, um, to, to explain that in systemd, um, the only way how you could make systemd reload its configuration is by doing a full reload where all the service information, system control, daemon reload, that was called, um, would be um, reloaded which turn out to be a problem if you have large setups because some people run like a 50,000 service or something on a single uh, system and if they if they do system control daemon reload um, then uh, the entire uh, then the entire reload takes ages and with the system control refresh uh, you can pinpoint that on specific services anyway my time's already over since a while so uh, very sorry for that if you have any further questions please come to that workshop on sunday and i'll, I'll answer anything about this stuff and about anything else about systemd I know this was very uh, technical. I still hope that many of you could follow at least some of the topics. Uh, thank you very much and uh, talk to you in either two hours or something or one hour when my other talk is or on Sunday for the questions. Thank you and sorry uh, for. Uh,